Hi, everybody. Wow, this is a huge room, and you guys are packed in here. Um, so I'm really excited to talk to you guys today about test automation. Um, I'm really excited that this is a combined uh, OJUG and with conference um, type of talk. Um, I think it's a really important topic to the community, and I'm glad so many people are interested in it. So we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, just some brief information about me. I'm an Omaha native. Um, I actually went to high school at Marion, um, and at the time, I there wasn't a ton of tech uh, programs there. So I went into UNO thinking that I was supposed to be a civil engineering major because I liked math and physics. Um, that changed my sophomore year. I had a really phenomenal teacher for my Java 1 program, um, and he kind of changed the course of my life. Um, shifted me towards computer science. I coupled that degree um, with majors in math, business, and cybersecurity as well. I like to kind of poke my head and see how tech fits into other things outside of just pure programming. Um, one of the other really important things that's happened in my life at UNO is um, becoming the founding president of ACMW. And I know that there's a few people here tonight who have been huge impacts on that program, Cindy Vlasnik being one of them. She was our faculty sponsor. Um, and that group strives to support, celebrate, and advocate for women in technology, which is something that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, so we'll do that through different conferences and meetups. We have people come in and present. Um, so that was a huge, pivotal moment in my life, moving me forward and keeping me going in tech. Um, currently, as mentioned, I'm pursuing my master's degree in management information systems, which is MIS, and also my MBA. Um, I'm not really sure where that's going to lead me, but we'll see. <laughs> um, more important than that, though, I think um, being an application developer at Mutual of Omaha has given me some of that real-world knowledge that I've um, really appreciated. Um, I was an intern at Mutual of Omaha for two years before I converted to be full-time after my graduation. Um, and I've loved every minute of it. I've had a lot of different experiences there, um, seen a wide array of technologies. Um, but this is kind of the place where I've settled in, and I really like what I'm doing right now. I think it's also important, this is, I don't want to call this a fun fact, <laughs> um, but I think it's important since I know some of you, but some of you are strangers. Um, it's important that you kind of know me as a human being as well, and so something that you probably wouldn't find on my resume. Um, I have pet fish, um, named after Lilo and Stitch characters. Uh, so this is Jumba and Pleakley and Cobra Bubbles. Um, <laughs> they're my pair programming buddies when I'm at home. <laughs> um, my fiance also has a fish um, named Dog because we couldn't get a dog at the time. <laughs> so <laughs> we're, we're making do with what we had available. Um, so that's a little fun fact about me, something you wouldn't find on LinkedIn. So for the agenda tonight, we're actually going to talk about some of the fundamentals of test automation. I'll walk you through an automated uh, sample test that I've written. We'll kind of apply that same logic to a case study, a project that I worked on at Mutual Omaha and then reflect on some lessons learned, kind of my own retrospective, what I've gained from that experience. All right, so the basics of test automation. I have this definition up here not to be condescending, um, but to kind of bring us back to the basics. So test automation is a method of software testing that makes use of special software tools <coughs> to control the execution of tests and then compares the actual test results with the predicted or expected ones. Um, and like I said, this is something that I think is really important to understand the basics of. When I was introduced to test automation, I was an intern at Mutual Omaha. I had gone through four and a half years of college and had never seen it in my life. And looking back, I wish I would have. Um, I was the person that wrote my Java programs, compiled them, then tried input, and then realized everything was broken. Um, so I went back and rewrote it. And that was a continuous cycle. And I should have realized, looking back on it, that that was a process that I should have automated. Um, so this kind of brings us back and centered us um, on that approach. There are a lot of different benefits to test automation. Um, it often improves your code quality. It increases the likelihood that code works as anticipated. It's easier to respond to changing requirements. And one of my favorite quotes from a conference I just attended down in Atlanta is that when you have test cases, you can deploy at 5 PM on a Friday and not have nightmares over the weekend, um, which was actually really empowering. <laughs> um, so we take kind of each of those in turn. Improving code quality, if you write code that is testable, and you're tending to write your tests first. Um, if you think about the definition of a method, I was taught that it's a small self-contained unit of code that accomplishes a singular, well-defined task. Um, so if you find code that does one thing and does it really, really well, odds are it has a pretty good test over it too, and that test was written first. So by writing tests first and then creating your code, it's an actual test-driven development, um, and it improves the readability of your code, how maintainable it is. 
Um, that also increases the likelihood that your code works as anticipated. And then if things are changing in <laughs> your business, which odds are they are, um, having that test coverage increases the likelihood that you can respond to those a lot quicker. Um, writing tests do take time um, if you do them well, but it's, um, I don't know, the worst that happens is you spend five minutes debugging a test case versus an entire day manually testing. So it's, it's definitely worth the investment. Putting this kind of test-centered approach um, into context with Agile, I think a lot of companies right now are striving to work in a very Agile way um, and to produce software that's better a lot faster. Um, so if we look at how this is kind of laid out, this is probably not the diagram you're used to seeing for an Agile approach, um, but it's one that I think actually really draws out the importance of testing. So in each of those concentric circles, it kind of highlights how often you should be doing something, whether it's at a release level and iteration and daily. Um, at the very, very center, that circle that says continues is something you probably want to be doing on an hourly basis or even by the minute. Um, and right there in the middle, it says test-driven development, TDD. Um, <laughs> so if you think about this diagram, the entire core of Agile is built on test-driven development. If you're not doing tests in Agile, you're probably not doing it right. And, and you're not getting the full benefit of what Agile can give you if you're not writing these tests. With that being said, there are different types of tests that you can write. Um, so this is what's known as the test pyramid. Um, and starting at the bottom, we see our unit level tests. This is what people tend to write a lot of these. And then as you go higher up the pyramid, there become fewer and fewer tests. Um, the numbers off to the side, that 10%, 20%, 70%, those are kind of relative depending upon your project. But this can give you a general idea of how many-ish you would want to write of each type of test. So as I said, in the bottom, there's unit tests. In that middle part, there's integration tests. And then up top, there's UI tests. Um, in the bottom, there's a lot more of them because they're cheap to execute and pretty quick to run. As you get higher up their pyramid, they're a lot longer when they run, and they're more expensive to execute. I also want to draw to the point that there is a manual testing part up there. <laughs> um, a lot of people get freaked out when we start talking about automated testing, like robots are going to take over the world. <laughs> it's just not true. Um, manual testing will still always have a place. Um, but we want to use it in special circumstances. So if you're really doing something manually more than once or twice, you should consider automating it. And the place that we use manual testing is when there's like a new feature that's come out or that has been created in your application. After that, once or twice, you probably want to put it into your regression set um, and make sure that that's being automated. So specifically, when we looked at that test pyramid, we're going to talk about that top tier today um, underneath the manual testing, which is UI testing. Um, and the framework that I've been working with a lot at Mutual um, is the automation framework called Spock and the browser automation tool called Jeb. So we'll kind of walk through each of those in turn. So Spock is a test and specification framework for Groovy and Java. Um, it gives us kind of the structure of how we want to run our tests. Um, so <laughs> some of the some of the keywords that you will find in Spock are given, when, and then. So the given is basically saying, I have some precondition. And then in the when block, you're going to say, when I perform some action. In the then block, you're going to say, I expect a certain thing to be true. So as kind of a real life example, given that your birthday is on a certain date, when that date rolls around each year, then your age increments by one, essentially. Jeb then is, can, or Jeb can be used in Spock as well in that framework. Jeb is a browser automation tool. It kind of sits on top of the Selenium web driver um, and it supports Groovy and Java, or Groovy and Spock syntax. So since we're using Spock, we'll work with Jeb as well. So I'm going to do a little bit of a quick demo. Um, I've been learning a little bit of Vue.js right now. Um, so I'm going to walk through and I want to see if I can get to some of the documentation on that website kind of on the fly and make sure that it's operating as I expect it to. <coughs> so we're going to go to their website. This is what their website looks like right now. Um, so this is the introduction page and um, I'm going to see if I can, I want to learn about component registration for example. So I want to be able to click on this link and know that I can get to this page. So that's something that if I was manually testing this, I would have to go sit and do. But there's a way that we can automate clicking on that link and making sure that we get to this page. So I'll show you how I was doing that. Um, and I'm going to start. Can you guys read that OK? OK. I'm going to start with um, <laughs> the test and then explain how I got to each step. Um, 
So you just saw me, I was at the ViewDocs homepage. When I clicked on the component registration link, then I was at the ViewDocs component registration page. You can read that in pretty much English and know that it makes sense. So we'll kind of talk through, um, this is what's called a specification. Um, it's kind of the equivalent of like business logic. So if you get a user, um, a business customer, basically saying, I want the app to be able to do this type of thing, um, this translates really well into specifications. Um, and a lot of times people will argue that specifications can drive um, your lower level functions, um, your lower level functional tests, which then derive your actual functions. Um, so it's kind of working your way down from the top of the pyramid. Um, but this is the specification. Um, I'll talk about, so in this given, the way that I know I'm at this ViewDocs homepage is over here. I've created a page object. Um, and when I have that um, in the test, I have that when to ViewDocs homepage. That part is executed, or the static app part is executed when it actually gets run. So in the ViewDocs homepage, I want to make sure that the title contains introduction. So if we go back over here, I mean, you can kind of see the title right there, but it's also in the HTML head. Um, I'm basically checking to see that that title in that head tag contains the word introduction. That's how I've confirmed for myself that I'm on that page. So that got us our given when, or are given to ViewDocs homepage. When I click on the component registration link, this is the part that gets a little tricky. Um, so the page object defines um, what content you can interact with on the web page. And so this content right here um, is something that I can interact with as um, part of the page specification, the test case itself. So over here, if I make this bigger, um, we saw the component registration link over here. If I do a quick, a quick inspect on that, I can see that I'm gonna look for an A tag that has the word like component registration in it. That's, it's basically a CSS selector that I wanna <coughs> grab from it. Um, a, a unique object or a unique characteristic about that part of the page that I can use um, to interact with it later on. So that's what this part does. I've defined the content on the page. I've named it to be component registration link and I'm looking for that A tag with the text that contains component registration. That's essentially what that part does. So then back at my spec, I've gotten to the ViewDocs homepage. I can click on that registration link. Um, and then I want to make sure that I'm at the ViewDocs component registration page. To find another page object over here, it's very similar to the homepage. It just checks to see that instead of containing the word introduction in the title, it contains component registration. Um, so that, whoops. That's pretty English readable. There's a little bit of abstraction as you get further away from the specification that becomes more technical. Um, but it can allow for some really cool collaboration between BA level and dev level. Um, if the BA can read this and understand what's going on in your test, that's really cool. Um, I'll talk about that later on with the case study, how we had some really cool turnouts from that. But we can see this execute. Um, Look, mom, no hands. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so that was a really cool, empowering moment for me when I first learned um, about Jeb and Spock. Um, to be, like, I, I seriously, I think I ran the test like three times in a row just to make sure I wasn't dreaming that I could like actually step away from my keyboard and it would do it on its own. Um, so that was really fun for me, um, learning the basics of that. So does that part all, like the concepts, the fundamentals of that make sense for the most part? Okay. Um, so we'll talk about now how I applied some of those basics kind of on a larger scale at Mutual Omaha. I was working um, on an application, it's an internal facing Grails application for our corporate parking system, which basically controls like, okay, you can park in this particular location in a ramp or you have the surface level parking or if you parked in the wrong spot, you get a, a ticket and things like that if people need to move around. So we had a huge UI set up for this um, and I was supposed to kind of create the test cases around that. So this was my experience with it. Um, as I said, we were backfilling for a, uh, an application that had already been established. Uh, we actually got to sit with our business partners, the parking admin, um, and record what she would normally do for her customer acceptance testing. Um, if I call it CAT, by the way, that's what I mean, customer acceptance testing. Um, and it was really cool 
um, because then we basically had a PDF of anything that we would ever need to do for a technical upgrade, we could do on our own if we wanted to. And the goal is that we could get from development on our own local machines all the way through to production for a technical upgrade without her having to even care. Um, so that was pretty cool. Um, as a sample test, I'll walk you through kind of one of the ones that she would normally do for a business case. Um, she was looking to create a citation report. So I'll show you the application, what it would look like for manual, and then show you how I translated it into code and show you a running example. Um, so this is what kind of a snapshot of our parking system would look like. This is the admin dashboard. It has counts for like who would need health service requests fulfilled if they need to park in a handicapped spot temporarily, um, if there's anybody on the wait list for a certain location, um, et cetera. So our parking admin would come in here, and in order to get to the parking um, citation report, we'd have to click on the Manage Citations button up there in the blue nav bar, and then click on the Citation Report button underneath that. That would get her to a page that looks like this. Um, and to test that this was actually working the way she thought it would, um, she would fill in the start date and the end date and then click generate report and make sure that these numbers down here looked like what she thought they should. So <laughs> it's not terribly long, but when you think about all of the other tests that she would have to write, and there are probably about 35 other test cases that she would normally run for CAT, those kind of tend to add up. So it was helpful when we were able to automate that and I'll illustrate how I went through some of that code, um, kind of building on what we had just shown in that demo. So to jog your memory, we started out at that admin dashboard page over here. Um, in the actual page source code itself, um, that index.gsp, we have a title tag with a message. Um, it's extracted somewhere else, um, but it basically resolves to the word home. So then in my page specification, that index.groovy, um, I'm defining that when I get to that page, I want to check and make sure that the title contains home. Um, so then to start my test, I'm going to say when I go to the admin dashboard, that checks to see that the title contains the word home. Then to click on the part of the nav bar, um, the manage citations button, um, I'm looking uh, at the source code that says that there's a link, an A tag, um, and I gave it an ID because that CSS selector that can be used in that uh, page object, which I'll get to, um, it needed something unique to grab. And so I gave it an ID called manage citations button. So then in that navbar.groovy, you see the page object get a little bit more filled in. Um, so the static content that you can interact with there then, um, it uses that manage citations button ID. And then I rename it, kind of give it a nickname that the BA would be able to interact with called Manage Citations button, which you then see down there at the bottom in the parking citation spec. I know I'm at the admin dashboard page, and now I want to click in the nav bar on the Manage Citations button. Same type of rules applied when I clicked on the drop down uh, citation report button. This time it was a link instead of, well, it was a G link. Um, so the ID there is citation report button. I created a nickname essentially for it in the page object called citation report, and I click on it in my test, the parking citation process spec. Then I know I would have gotten to this page. Um, again, I check to see that the title is what I think it is. Um, and in this case, that parking citation report code at the top essentially resolves to citation report. Um, so I have it in my source code. I've defined it in my page object so I can interact with it in my test. Um, and so then I actually do use it in my parking citation process spec. So I've gone from the admin dashboard, clicked on those steps in the nav bar, and now I'm at the manager citation report page. I fill in the start date. There's a text field for that. Um, and I gave it the ID report start date. Define it as content again. You guys get the picture. Um, so when I define a start date in my test, same rules apply for the end date, pretty much named the same exact way. I had to grab this button here to simulate the user clicking on the button. Um, so I gave it the ID generate report button um, to find the content, clicked on it in my test. Um, and then I checked to see that these numbers are what I think they should be. When I was going through those dates, um, it's important we have bootstrap data that we've defined for our test cases. They can also be defined in the given part of your uh, specification. Um, but we have data, this is in a test environment, so I knew what to expect in between certain date ranges. So I knew that these values would be correct. So that's why you see um, at the bottom, when I have the parking citation process spec, 
Um, I'm expecting the citations in the range, the text of that information to contain the number two. Um, that's based on the data that we define in our bootstrap. Very similar thing happens um, for notification sent and year to date. So at the end, this is essentially what our test case looks like. When I'm at the admin dashboard and I click on the manage citation button in the nav bar, I click on the citation report button in the nav bar, then I should be at the manage citation page. Then I'm gonna specify a start date of January 25th and the end date, June 15th. Um, and I click on the generate report button. Then I wanna be um, looking for the citations in the range to be two, the notification sent to be zero, and the year to date to be also zero. So this is a quick snapshot of me. I ran that test locally at work. Um, So it goes a heck of a lot faster than a user might normally be able to do it, and it's probably a little bit more interesting than the demo that I did earlier. It shows some typing, shows some clicking, um, and it's, very, it's a very real business case for us. Um, so the cool thing about these tests, writing those tests, um, they get run every time we check in our code um, to Bitbucket. So we know that any time we push information out, um, that essentially our parking admins are cool with it. Um, it, we have a lot of different steps in there. Um, we have the initialization step, the build step, static code analysis, um, a snapshot, a release candidate, and an actual a release as well. Um, but hypothetically, there are, um, well, actually, literally, there are other steps that we can use um, to deploy to our integration environment, our customer acceptance environment, and then ultimately to production. So at that point, there's really not a lot stopping us from experiencing real DevOps. <laughs> Um, on the left side, you see stuff that's traditionally very developer-based, and then on the right, you see stuff that's very operations. Um, but with these automated tests, when we've gotten our business users' approval to use these for any technical upgrade, we can do the release, we can do the deploy, <laughs> we can do the operation, we can do the monitoring all, on our like all by ourselves, um, which is very empowering. Um, there's one thing that I really don't like about this um, diagram, though, and it's that testing is really a part of all of it. I know this is the traditional image you would see for DevOps, but test doesn't really get its own segment in my mind. Tests get run at the release, at the deploy, at the operation, and it's the reason that we can monitor. So um, I, I kind of like that agile picture a little bit better that I showed at the beginning where test is really at the heart of all of it. Um, but for familiarity, that's what you get. So we ran a couple metrics um, on the parking system after we'd done some automated test cases. Um, and we had grabbed 135 plus actions that our user would normally have to do to make sure that our app is okay. Um, that normally, when she sat down and explained it to us, took her about 43 minutes. Um, and with the automated tests that I've been running, um, that actual UI specification part of it that runs on our pipeline, our continuous delivery pipeline, um, runs in under two minutes. Um, which saves her a lot of time and it allows us to be kind of self-motivated if we wanted to try other things and get things off the ground. Um, we know that she agrees to them for the most part. Some other interesting metrics. Um, so this is captured from SonarCube, um, which is kind of like a quality assurance type system. Um, so when our code gets run, it generates a report for us about how we're doing essentially. Um, so some interesting parts of this that I wanted to pull out, like our technical debt was originally like, it would take us 80 minutes to fix something. <laughs> like, that's like an hour and a half almost. And then it's now down to 20 minutes because we've kind of worked through some of the kinks in the system as we've written these tests. Mm -hmm. um, our bugs have gone down, we've eliminated all of them that SonarCube has identified. And our test coverage has gone through the roof, it's literally doubled. Um, so that's pretty empowering. And then actually through interacting with the UI, we've covered some conditions that probably wouldn't normally have been interacted with. It's sketchy to put a line of code into production that you haven't tested. Um, and so knowing that there are conditions that weren't covered that we caught now using the UI, that's a good thing. <coughs> um, I know this sounds trivial, <laughs> but it's hard to capture metrics on projects that don't have test cases. Um, I did find one though, <laughs> and it happened because I was working on a project. Um, I'll, I'll, so this metric is my heart rate. <laughs> um, <laughs> so 
I had just finished writing some of the parking application test cases and I got asked to work on, um, it was a small little tweak that I needed to make to our ergonomics application. So somebody needs to have their desk adjusted or something for a doctor or medical reason. Um, they could do that. This is the ergonomics. And so I was supposed to just kind of update some like our drivers and stuff. It shouldn't have been a big deal. Um, <laughs> I was an intern, right? I'm going to use that excuse. Um, so <laughs> at point one, I did something I probably shouldn't have, and I pulled the repository down directly and just kind of started looking at it, and I was trying to get familiar with it. So I realized I was working directly on the develop branch at point one, and my heart rate kind of went up a little bit. Um, at point two, I realized I had pushed to the develop branch. <laughs> um, <laughs> so all those changes that I had made, um, it was going to affect everybody. Um, if they wanted to pull down and work on the project locally, they now had my changes, which really hadn't been like, approved. I didn't have a PR for it yet. Um, but at point three, I was like, well, Lauren, it's fine. It's still building on the pipeline, right? Like, it's, it's cool. We have tests around that. It'll get executed. And at point four, I was like, holy god, there's only 23% test coverage, and nothing that I wrote even like, is covered by that. <laughs> so <laughs> um, it was kind of an interesting experience. Um, so that's an interesting metric, and one that doesn't get caught by SonarQ, but it'd be interesting if companies could keep like a little, literally a pulse, <laughs> literally a pulse on what's happening with their developers. Um, <laughs> it's just not worth the 141 beats per minute, guys. Like, it's just not. Um, so I had kind of calmed down a little bit, and then I went and talked to our team, and I'm like, guys, I made a really big mistake. This is what happened. Um, and somebody, in response to my a little bit of fluster, um, <laughs> they go, well, at least you'll have job security. Um, and yeah, I probably would have job security, but I don't want job security because there aren't tests. Um, I, I don't know, that just doesn't feel right to me. Um, and then I also had the comment of, um, well, this is kind of related to a vendor, um, so you might have to learn how to test in production. Um, and you know, since you're testing in production, you're gonna have to be careful about what test cases you use. It's really all about minimizing risk. How do you even say that? Like, <laughs> it's not about minimizing risk. If you were really minimizing risk, you would have had those test cases written, um, and it would have been done before you even started developing. So it was kind of just an interesting juxtaposition. I felt it was like emotional whiplash as I was going from parking into ergonomics um, and hearing <laughs> the differences between those. So that was kind of the dark side of not having test cases. Um, so I did want to draw out some of the positives that came out of having, um, unintended positives that came out of having test cases for our parking application. Um, these were kind of intangibles that I don't know how to capture on a Fitbit yet. Um, <laughs> so having automated test cases for the parking application um, put us in a position where we could work with um, some of the, like, the containerization concepts, um, like Docker. Um, and we've been collaborating with a couple people within our company to see if we can basically abuse that application and experiment all we want, knowing that our customer is cool with it. Um, it also enabled us to work towards moving parts of our application to Azure. Um, you guys are all familiar, we're at Microsoft. <laughs> um, cloud technology. Um, so that was, it was really cool to be able to have that freedom um, and know that we were essentially safe, <laughs> having that coverage, that safety net. Uh, so there were other considerations that we ran into um, as we were working through that parking application that as an intern at the time and still even as an application developer, um, I found to be kind of interesting. I think they're concepts that might plague people as they are starting to write test cases more and more. Um, so some questions that we had is how do you determine if your tests are sufficient? Like when do you stop writing test cases? Because um, some people get really, oh my god, test, test forever. Um, and then they don't ever actually write code. <laughs> so knowing that your tests are sufficient, I've heard some people say test until you don't have any more questions about what your code does. Um, that's kind of an interesting way of phrasing it because I'm, as an application developer, very new to Mutual, will have way more questions <laughs> than somebody else on the team who's been there a while. Um, but maybe that's a good thing. Um, so that's kind of an interesting way of putting it. Um, and going back to that quote that I had earlier, test so that you can deploy at 5 p.m. on a Friday and not have nightmares. Um, another consideration we had, how do you prioritize automating um, your tests? Um, some people have created this kind of unwritten rule that no code can go into production unless there's 80% test coverage on it. Um, it kind of depends, again, on your project, how, what you guys want to decide is a standard for yourselves. Um, but it's important to actually make it a priority, your definition of done. Nothing goes into production unless you have something there that says we've tested it enough. 
um, standards that you want to follow. In the examples that I've shown, I was pulling information from the pages using an ID um, and then putting that in my page specification, which I could interact with um, later on in the actual test case. There are some people who want to have certain tags available for how you would grab that data, um, and that kind of is up to you guys. Um, we're trying to kind of make it a standard across our company. That way, if people are popping around from team to team or need to go in and look at something, they would understand what they need to find. Um, who is responsible for writing and maintaining tests, and how do they work together? I kind of alluded to this earlier. Um, with the way that Jeb and Spock works, it's very readable. Before I even showed you guys what the test was going to do, you understood what I was showing you in that page specification. You guys could read it. Um, so that's something that we've considered having like a BA role. Um, actually write the page, like the specification itself. Um, and then maybe the developer works with the BA to write the page object, or the developer does that, and then the developer can do the actual getting the ID tag um, and things like that. Um, so it's actually a really great opportunity for collaboration between the two people. Um, kind of depends on the team. How do you measure progress towards automation? Um, I've heard some people at Mutual trying to figure out, okay, yeah, we can measure um, how many uncovered conditions we have, if what percent test coverage we have. Um, but there's kind of this larger theme that we have going on too about like, um, are there processes that we're not automating that we should and how do we account for those? Um, so that kind of leads me to my final point. The biggest question is what can you guys automate? Um, so think about what you guys have going on at work um, or even in your personal life. Just play around with Jeb and Spock. It's pretty cool. It's really powerful. Um, I've enjoyed my experience with it. So I encourage you guys to try it out.